Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. And now a word from our sponsor. Are you looking for new ways to diversify your portfolio while earning passive monthly income? Roofstock's online marketplace is making it easier than ever to buy, sell, and own tenant-occupied investment properties in top rental markets across the country, whether it's your first time or you're a seasoned pro. All Roofstock certified properties are inspected in person to ensure they're in good condition and have reliable tenants in place, so you can start earning monthly rental income right away. Roofstock even connects you with local vetted property managers, so you can separate investing from operations, which would be my nightmare. Best of all, Roofstock's certified properties are backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. Roofstock, property investing made simple. Visit roofstock.com forward slash meb to learn more about rental home investing and browse exclusive listings today. And now back to the show. Welcome podcast listeners. Today we have a fantastic different episode for you. Our guest is an international entrepreneur, global investor, and a self-professed permanent traveler. He started his own private investment bank, founded one of the largest agricultural production companies in South America, and even started an international charity that provides entrepreneurial education to young people. You might know him from his newsletter, Sovereign Man. It focuses on investments, but also far more as we'll talk about today. Welcome to the podcast, Simon Black. Thanks for that great intro. So let's start with a little bit of background on you. I mean, there's a lot we're going to get into today, and it's pretty wide ranging. But why don't, why don't you give our audience, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're coming from, and, and what led you to start Sovereign Man? That's a story you'd think I'd probably have, uh, I'd be able to tell better now. I, I've told it a few times, but uh, I'll, I'll try and get hit the hit the high notes, really. I, I came out of the military, really. That's, that's my background. I'm 38 now. And that was... Jesus feels like a lifetime ago, but uh, I was I was in the military. I was an intelligence officer. I went to the academy, and when I graduated, it was right, you know, pretty much uh, when 9/11 and all those things kicked off. And so I I spent a fair amount of my military career uh, overseas. And one of the most important things that really happened to me in my development, both I think personally and professionally, was the start of the Iraq War. And I remember as an intelligence officer sitting there watching. George Bush constantly telling the world that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and, and you know, Colin Powell in front of the United Nations talking about this. And so many people knew that it was just wrong. Everything about it was just wrong. And, and that, was a, that was a huge moment for me because I thought, well, wait a minute. You know, if they're willing to lie to make a case to go to war, they're willing to lie about something like that. What else are they lying about? Uh, and then that was – that was actually – was was very – almost dark for me, you know, as I realized, well, all this stuff that I, you know, sort of thought and, and believed turned out to be not true. Uh, and it led me down a path where I started looking at so much more, researching so much more, and a lot of things that I always took for granted took me down into, you know, where I started really exploring things about the national debt and the currency and the system of central banking and so forth. I learned so much about that. And that's been a significant part of my life now where, you know, I do travel a lot. You mentioned that I hit probably 30 or 40 different countries in a year. I've traveled to, I think, 120, a little bit more than 120 at this point in my life on all seven continents. And, you know, at this point, what I do is just spend a lot of time looking at business opportunities, starting companies, acquiring companies. But at the core of the core of it all, fundamentally, is an ethos in personal freedom. And to me, that that means fundamentally being self-reliant, reducing your uh, dependency, and and uh, you know creating uh, sustainability for yourself. Uh, and that's just really at the core of, uh, of of what we do and what what Sovereign Man Publishing Company is really all about. And it's interesting because we spend a lot of time on this podcast talking about investing risks and how to protect your portfolio and think of kind of all the various outcomes. But I, you know, I don't know necessarily a lot of people that really spend as much time thinking about it on a personal level. And so a lot of what you talk about freedoms and personal liberty and 
protecting one's life and assets from various outside influences such as the government. It seems like in many ways, you know, you're kind of founding your business and all the various branches now, but Sovereign Man in general, seems like a little bit of reaction, like you said, to the overall state of the world, but particularly, you know, to to some various government overreaches. Are are you seeing any red flags in particular in the U.S. or uh, globally as well that you've been touching on in Sovereign Man at all? I see a lot of red flags. I see a lot of issues. One of the things that I think I see worldwide is a greater trend towards socialism. Uh, And this is something that actually does deeply concern me that I think a lot of people realize how much the system is broken. It seems like it's rigged in the, you know, in the favor of a handful of people. And, and there's I mean, so many people, whether they're sort of blue collar workers, whatever, everybody kind of feels like they're getting screwed. All those kids that were standing and protesting, uh, you know, Occupy movements and so forth all over the world. It's like everybody sort of understands intuitively that there's something wrong. The problem is, is that they don't understand specifically what it is and why, what's the source of the problem. And so they just blame capitalism. They blame wealthy people. They blame rich people. They blame capitalism as an institution itself. And the knee jerk reaction to that is socialism. I want more stuff. I want more free stuff. I want other people are required. I'm entitled to to receive free stuff from everybody else. And I see this trend all over the world. And that's deeply disturbing is that the trend in that direction is there's just way too many people who want to jump on the cart and way too few people pulling the cart. And that's just totally not sustainable. Plus, it's just to me intellectually offensive to feel like there's just so many people who who now have a sense of entitlement to the hard work and sweat and labor of other people. But that's 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 what I think for me, one of the most dangerous trends that I see. And I do see it worldwide. You know, and it's funny is you look at a country like Venezuela. And so we actually just did this office hours where I said, hey, look, I'm going to open my calendar the next two weeks to my followers on the podcast as well as email. And I said, I'm going to set up 30 minute calls and we'll talk with people all over the world, whatever you want to talk about. You want to talk about investments, you want to talk about the Denver Broncos, whatever. And, you know, we did a call with some folks in Venezuela and it's just such a reminder of the the challenges of socialism. But I feel with a lot of individuals and particularly younger crowd, the lessons of maybe our parents and parents' parents that kind of went through, there's a certain amount of time and, and, and I feel like it's it, it's hard for them to relearn it without experiencing it. You know, you can read about it in books, but something like Venezuela where it's just kind of just spiraling down into to chaos is is such a perfect example of that. And so you're looking at a lot of these challenges, you know, I mean, we could go on about the government probably all day on financial conditions and taxes and everything else. But but all this kind of leads, you know, I've read a lot of y'all stuff leads to kind of y'all talking about plan B, you know, and mainly thinking about, you know, your life in general. So I was wondering if you could give us an overview, uh, you know, given all these challenges, an overview of of kind of what you mean by this, and then we could possibly dive into some specific action steps as well. Yeah, sure. I'll just say one thing about, you know, Venezuela is a great example. Uh, I'm actually planning a trip probably late next week to head back there. I've been a few times and it's always been interesting to me to see how it just continues to deteriorate um, as an outsider. But one thing I'll I'll just point out about Venezuela is, you know, one of the big problems they have is that, you know, there's people, there's people that are literally starving. There's no food. People can't eat because there's not enough food. And I look at that and I think, you know, if anybody's ever been, you'll know that it, there's highly productive soil. There's tons of water. There's absolutely and they're they're in a they're in a, a climate zone. They've got a lot of climate zones in the country, many of which they can basically grow every single day of the year because they don't have a cold season winter. So they can always plant and always grow, and yet they don't have enough food, right? There's something wrong with that. There's no re- you know I, I can understand if it was Antarctica and people are starving in Antarctica because they can't grow food. You know, this is Venezuela. They can grow all their own food, and yet there's not enough food. And that is such obvious proof that there's something seriously wrong with this whole idea, this whole concept of central planning and socialism and so forth. And yet the solution seems to be we need more of that. You know, they don't call it that, but that's basically, you know, what what it is. And then so many policies we see all over the world are taking us more and more in that direction. It's, leads to the, you know, the issue of, of plan B is something that we talk about a lot, something we write about a lot. And, and you know, some of these ideas and, and these things, it, it makes people a little bit uncomfortable to think about because it does defy convention, right? We, if you're in the U.S., for example, you sort of grow up thinking, okay, I'm told my entire life, the U.S. is the most powerful, wealthiest country in the world and so forth. Okay, great. And that's fine. And so when, when, when all of a sudden, 
you're left to 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 wrestle with the idea of well, well, wait a minute. Let's look at their balance sheet and find out that this country is actually insolvent according to its own internally generated balance sheet to the tune of negative seventy trillion dollars. You know that might not necessarily turn out all that well. You know, they get twenty one trillion dollars in nominal debt. They've got. Uh, I mean, they lost a trillion dollars. Last year, again, according to their own financial statements, a trillion dollars they lost in a year where they weren't fighting a war, they weren't fighting off a recession, they weren't fighting off a bank crisis, and yet the government still managed to lose a trillion dollars. You know, Social Security is rapidly running out of money. And this isn't, you know, this isn't Simon Black saying Social Security is running out of money. The Treasury Secretary of the United States of America publishes a report every year saying, hey, Social Security is running out of money. We've got, you know, 10 or 12 years left basically before this program has completely run out of money. I mean, that should be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal every day. And yet it's not. Nobody really ever even thinks about this stuff because we're told our entire lives that, oh, yeah, this is the wealthiest, most powerful country in the world. And all, you know, our poll contention is, is that, all right, when you're living in this place that's got this enormous pile of debt, $70 trillion in negative equity that's losing a trillion dollars a year with pension programs that are insolvent with a central bank that on a mark to market basis is probably insolvent that even, you know, on a nominal basis has a net capital level that's less than 1% of its assets, that maybe just maybe there might be some consequences at some point down the road. And it makes sense, I think, for any rational person to say that, well, when there's a risk that big, that it certainly makes sense to take some rational steps to you know, reduce the, the consequences that you might be exposed to. And that's really what we you know, kind of call a, a plan B. Rational people have a plan B. You don't have to be wearing a tinfoil hat and think that the aliens are coming to you know, invade from outer space to have a plan B. This is what rational people do. You know, people, when they, you know, when they buy stocks, they buy protective put options. I mean, that's a plan B. It's, it's just an insurance policy, basically. That's what all this stuff really is. It's an insurance policy. It's just a type of insurance policy to, you know, when you're looking at sort of very big sovereign and even systemic risks uh, to say, okay, well, you know, it's not about what do, what do I do if Apple tanks or what do I do if the stock market tanks? Well, what do I do if there's, you know, if there become actually serious problems in the system? And these problems in the system are based on risks that we can see that are right there based on publicly available data, that the government itself publishes data that says we are broke. And, you know, maybe they continue to be broke. Maybe they can continue to lose trillions of dollars. Maybe the debt can continue to go up in vast quantities every year forever and ever until the end of time with no consequences whatsoever. But I'm not willing to bet everything that I've ever earned or everything that I will earn or achieve in my entire life on this hope that a government run by out-of-touch politicians will be able to indefinitely and forever indebt itself with no end in sight and never have any consequence. That just doesn't make any sense to me as a rational person. I think as a rational person, looking at data, and by the way, that data is publicly available and published by the government itself, it certainly makes sense to take some rational steps to you know, reduce the consequences and the exposure that I have to those consequences. That really what a plan B is all about. It's an insurance policy. That's a perfect lead in. And we talk about a lot of the things you mentioned in the investing world, but a lot of kind of your action steps. And I got about five or 10 here that you've mentioned in various places, you know, also apply to diversifying globally, kind of your personal life and in general, in your existence. You want to touch on a couple of those that you think are, are kind of most important and interesting to you? Well, sure. I mean, let's start with finance. For any investor, every investor understands the concept of diversification. A lot of people diversify in funny ways. You know, they'll buy Apple and Netflix uh, and you know, think that that's, that's diversification when it's not. You know, real diversification requires, you know, moving across entire asset classes, across entire geographies, uh, in, across entire ways of thinking. But if you start with something like finance, one thing that pretty much everybody who's listening to this has some exposure to, you know, is uh, everybody's probably got a bank account. And the reality is, is that wherever you happen to be in the world, if you have all of your eggs in, in one basket, sort of in the same banking system, you're not diversified. And, you know, there are risks, especially depending on where you are. If you're in Europe, Right now, if you have all, of, if you're in Italy and you have all of your money in the Italian banking system, you're really taking on a lot of risk because you're dealing in a banking system that has known insolvencies, uh, supersized insolvencies uh, that uh, they go way beyond the government and taxpayers' ability to bail any of that stuff out. Why would you keep 100% of your capital trapped in a banking system with known solvency issues? 
And I think you can walk that dog and, and sort of exercise that same logic across a number of banking systems. And, uh, you know, we could we could talk about that you know, all day long. But I think even even with respect to, you know, thinking beyond solvency and even liquidity issues, there's still a number of other a number of other issues, including, for example, your liability risk. If you hold all of your assets in the same country where you live, in the same banking system uh, where you live, and you get sued, some some frivolous lawsuit because you have a neighbor and his idiot kid fell into your swimming pool and he wants to sue you for everything that you're worth, and now you've got all of your assets tied up in that jurisdiction and, that, and your, your bank account can be levied you know, by any judge in that jurisdiction. Your bank account can be levied by any administrative agency at the state, local, or federal level, even by because of some clerical error. So the point is, is that you, know, you have all this risk. Why take that risk? You know, why expose everything that you have to a level of risk that is certainly non-zero and the impact of that is, could be quite substantial? You know, why take that chance? So like, what's a reasonable number of accounts? You know, most, most listeners would be listening to this from all over the world. Is it, you know, at a minimum two and, and four, four different jurisdictions is more comfortable? Is, is there a particular number or is no. it more conceptual or? I would never, I think, give a, a template to say, you know, oh, it's got to be, you need to have three of these and two of those. Uh, I don't, it, you know, I think the whole idea, it's just, it's not about following a recipe. It's just about adjusting your thinking. Right. And so if, you know, if you can adjust your thinking to realize that it and expand your thinking to the entire world and realize, hey, there's a, there's a great big world out there. It turns out that there are different banking systems, different jurisdictions out there where the banks are actually way better capitalized, that are way more liquid, that actually pay rates of interest that are, you know, that, that manage even keep up with inflation. You know, how am I worse off by holding some money there? In a place where my, you know, my my bank is safe, strong, conservative, well capitalized, liquid, pays me a good rate of interest. Oh, and it also happens to be in a jurisdiction where if some idiot tries to sue me frivolously, I still have some rainy day money set aside, so I know I'm always going to be able to feed my family. I'm not worse off for that, even if nothing bad ever happens. There's no downside to doing that. There's no consequence for me that I have to suffer. I'm never going to wake up and roll out of bed in the morning and be frustrated because my bank is too well capitalized because my, you know, because my money's safe and it's too difficult for people to sue me. You know, those words are never going to come out of my mouth. Right. And so that's, it's just a way of thinking. I don't know that it's a, you should have at least two or whatever. There's a number of factors that go into that, you know, how much money you have and how comfortable you are, uh, you know, moving some funds overseas and so forth. But it's just a way of thinking to really expand your horizons to the entire world and realize that it is a, big world out there. And there's a lot of options and opportunities. And by expanding your thinking, you expand your options, you expand your opportunities, you expand your prosperity that way. You know, I'm not going to put you on the spot here, but are there any countries in general that you feel kind of predisposed to thinking are particularly reasonable choices? Or is it kind of just do your own homework and find find what's right for you? Well, yeah. And I mean, of course, I mean, this is the research we do on a regular basis. So we have reports that go on for hundreds of pages about this. But I mean, there, there are a number of places and it really varies based on an individual circumstances. But I would, you know, I would submit Hong Kong as an example. Banks in Hong Kong, just to give you an idea, tend to be very highly capitalized, meaning that they set aside plentiful reserves for a rainy day. The banks are also extremely liquid, meaning that the loan to deposit ratio is very conservative. They keep an exceptionally high amount of cash and cash equivalents as a percentage of customer deposits, i.e. they're not just wildly speculating with their customers' money on the latest investment fad, whether it's you know providing 105% no money down mortgages to unemployed bus drivers, you know these sorts of things. They don't do that sort of thing in Hong Kong. It's backed by an insurance fund that's actually solvent and well capitalized and, and a monetary authority, a central bank that is one of the most well capitalized on the planet. So if you just look at the numbers objectively and rationally, you'll see that it stacks up and this is actually a very, you know, a very sound banking system. So that's just a, that's just one example. But if you put the numbers side by side, if you compare Hong Kong with most of Western Europe and even by the way the United States, then you look at and you start with the central bank, the government, the insurance fund, the banks themselves and so forth and you actually look at these numbers for liquidity and solvency and so forth, it's so obvious which is the better option. You also talk a little bit about passports, you know, and then this is, this is something I've seen you mention many times, which is, which is talking about having a second passport and 
just so you're not beholden to just one country. Maybe you talk about that real quickly, because I'm guessing that a solid percentage of our listeners may or may not even have a passport in the first place. I would hope most of you do. <laughs> but but some people, even the idea of a second passport may not have even heard of. Maybe comment on that real quickly and why that might, why that might be an interesting idea. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, look, I, we started, you know, talking about this idea of a plan B. It's really all about diversification, right? We started talking about banking because banking is, is another form of financial diversification. But you start getting into personal diversification. And yeah, that even means something like, you know, where's your nationality? I would love to live in a world where we didn't actually require passports. I think it's kind of silly that I have to pull out this little booklet and, you know, somebody swipes it and scans or whatever. It's kind of stupid, but I don't get to live in that world. Uh, so for me, the, uh, you know, instead of having zero, the answer is to have multiple. And what does that mean? Having another passport is, is simply the ultimate option. It means that no matter what happens, there's always another place where you're welcome to go, that you can go with your family and you can live and you can work and you can invest and you can do business and you can do all these things. In certain cases, it even entitles you to go to multiple countries in the case of, you know, perhaps a European Union passport or something like that. It means that you can travel to more places. You might be able to do business in more places. You can make investments in more places around the world because of this. And so it does really provide a lot of options. This is something, frankly, that a lot of people might be eligible for, but don't even realize there are so many different ways to obtain a second passport, you know, for certain people that, you know, if you have grandparents from Ireland or Poland or so many different places, then you can actually get another passport right now at almost no cost. It's, uh, you know, it's a relatively easy process to be able to, uh, you know, apply for this. You can go through a consulate or, uh, you know, your local embassy and if you can prove sort of a, a chain of, of ancestry in certain places. But there are a number of ways to do it. You can become a naturalized citizen and I mean, there are economic investment programs to obtain citizenship. But the point is, is that obtaining another passport is simply that. It is, an, it, it is the ultimate insurance policy. It's a put option for you and your family, not against, you know, problems in the, in the financial markets and so forth, but larger problems, uh, systemic issues, sovereign issues and so forth, and things that you might never, you know, ever, it's an insurance policy you might never actually have to use ever. But in the highly unlikely event that you might, you're going to be damn glad that you have it. And I think that's really the case with most uh, good insurance policies. And a good insurance policy is also one that can, you know, cover you against really cataclysmic risks, but, you know, risks that are so, you know, unlikely, you don't even really want to think about it. But the impact can be quite high. The impact can be quite severe, but also one that doesn't cost very much. And again, if you've got ancestors, you've got grandparents from Ireland or Poland or Italy or so many other places, you can obtain a second passport at minimal cost, minimal cost. And so the, the, the cost of this insurance policy is almost nothing. Um, and it's one of those things, why wouldn't you do that? You get so much benefit. And not only you, but your kids and your children's children and so forth, this whole line of descendants will be able to benefit from a little bit of work, you know, that you put into this now. It's just, it's, again, it's just, it's all benefit. There's no downside to doing this. It's all upside and very minimal cost and just something that makes rational sense. I was smiling as you were giving that description because we're recording this podcast the morning after there was a lot of saber rattling between the Trump administration and North Korea. And poor Guam is getting in, in the middle of this. North Korea talking about potential preemptive attacks on Guam. So by the time this comes out, who knows, maybe, maybe the, the world may not even exist anymore, which is, I was laughing as you were saying that. But so two things. One, you talk a little bit about legally reducing your tax burden as well as keeping cash outside of the banking system. Any quick thoughts on those before we kind of slide a little more into the the investing space? I think it is an investment. I mean, reducing your taxes, taking some completely legitimate steps to reduce the amount that you owe, that's the easiest return on investment you'll ever make. Because any other investment, you know, the return on investment requires that you have to accept some level of risk. But reducing your taxes, there's no risk in that, right? You just follow the forms, you take whatever steps that you take, and you know, you can slash your taxes by 10, 15, 20, 30 percent, whatever it is uh, that you can do. That is the easiest, lowest zero risk return on investment you could ever make in your entire life. So, it, I mean, again, if you have those options available and I think everybody has ways on uh, things that they can do to reduce what they owe, why wouldn't you do that? There are always things. And if you don't, then you're just leaving money on the table. And my opinion, I think if you if you fundamentally disagree with your politicians, the best way to actually voice that discontent isn't to go down to a voting booth and, you know, punching a chat and dumping in a ballot box. 
Uh, the best way to do that is to restrict the resources that they have available to squander on things that you don't agree with. And the way that you can do that is to take legal steps to reduce what you owe. And, you know, there's an entire tax code full of ways to do that. Any pertinent example or two or any favorites that come to mind or is it really kind of individual specific? Well, taxes are always uh, extremely individual. But for example, I mean, if you're a business owner, for example, there are so many things that you can do ranging from, uh, I mean, you know, simple uh, mundane things to, you know, more more complicated and exotic. We've talked a lot about, for example, setting up, you know, different retirement account structures that, uh, you know, like a SEP uh, IRA, something that really allows you to uh, maximize retirement contributions or, you know, different kinds of captive insurance companies, for example, which, you know, will allow you to take uh, literally millions of dollars off the table and move into uh, an insurance company. You know, people can set up all kinds of uh, exotic structures, some foreign, some domestic, but there, there are really a number of ways uh, to do that, which range dramatically based on the type of income that you have, whether it's a wage income, investment income, business income, et cetera, the level of assets and income that you have and so forth. But I, I think pretty much every, you know, there are always ways uh, to really reduce the amount that you owe. And, and you'll never find a, a lower risk return on investment than that. We talk a lot about taxes on this show. And I think that's really actually really great advice. And we, we manage an insurance dedicated fund. And there's so many of these uh, vehicles and strategies that it's it's certainly worth the time to, to spend some serious time looking into. You talk a little bit about cash outside the banking system. So we talked about diversifying it across countries and across various economies and geographies. What do you mean when you talk about potentially having cash outside of the banking system? Well, look, if you think about cash, cash can have a lot of different meanings, right? We can talk about physical currency that we have in our pockets. We can talk about cash that we have in a bank account. Or, you know, if you're at, at, a, at a higher level, you know, higher investment level or institutional level, we talk about cash like government bonds, for example, these are cash equivalents. And at the moment, you know, when, when everything in the system is working well, these are basically three different forms of the same money, government bonds, electronic bank balances, and physical cash. These are all basically different forms of the same thing. If you have a, you know, a thousand dollar savings bond versus a thousand dollar bank deposit versus a thousand dollars in cash, they're all the same. Well, the three different forms of money, they just happen to have right now a one to one to one exchange rate. Now, when things don't go well in the system, then that exchange rate breaks down. And as an example, we can think back to 2013. I believe it was March in 2013 when the government of Cyprus basically froze everybody's bank account in the entire country. And you guys probably remember this. The entire country was locked out of its bank accounts because the the banking system uh, was rendered insolvent and they couldn't bail it out. And so they, in order to prevent runs on banks and so forth, they just froze all the banks, all the bank accounts. Now, when your bank balance is you know, it doesn't matter what your bank balance was. It doesn't matter what number was printed on the screen when you logged in. If you can't access your savings, right, it's basically worthless. And so in a situation like that, obviously cash became in very high demand and your bank balance was was essentially worthless. So that one-to-one-to-one exchange rate between physical cash and the bank balance, you know, essentially broke down. When a government defaults on its debt, you know, Greece, for example, being in a in a crisis situation and not being able to pay its its uh, its creditors and so forth, clearly that one to one and one exchange rate between physical cash and a government bond cash equivalent that breaks down. And so the idea is to not. It's all about diversification again. Don't hold all your eggs in one basket. If you have a hundred percent of your savings in the banking system, particularly in the banking system in the country in which you live, you are taking on some additional risk. And there are ways to diversify against that, including even just going to the bank and withdrawing some money uh, and, you know, stuffing it, you know, to taking a few thousand dollars and putting it in your safe at home. And now you've got a little bit of money, you know, you've got a, a month's worth of expenses or so that's not in the banking system. And again, you're not really worse off. It's, it's, it didn't really cost you anything to do that. There's no real downside there. What do you, what's the opportunity cost? You're missing out on two basis points of interest. You know, I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's really no downside there. So you still have cash. It's just, it's just cash in a different form. And what that means is if there's any, any real problems in the banking system, then, you know, you still have another form of money Uh, That's okay. Same reason why you might want to hold some money overseas as well. There's two questions that immediately came to mind there. I was laughing again as you were talking because my father, who is an aerospace guy and had, you know, the top clearance and worked at Lockheed and a lot of those places many years after he passed and the brothers were kind of going through a lot of his personal items. We found a briefcase that had 
passport and like 10 or 20 grand in it along with some other items and we laughed because we're like was he was he thinking about making a a getaway at one point or was he just planning for some of the things you talk about and so uh we have a lot of fond memories about that so two two things one i would like to hear you i've actually never seen you write about this so um i may be looking in the wrong places maybe you have a lot your thoughts in general on crypto type of currencies while we're on the subject of cash and then the second part of the question is also your thoughts on precious metals. Those are two topics I know that a lot of people have interest in and would love to hear uh, your thoughts. I think both of them make a lot of sense. Precious metals are one of the oldest forms of money. Cryptocurrency is one of the newest forms of money. The thing I like about both of them is that you know the same characteristic uh, holds true with, with both is that they're not controlled by unelected bureaucrats and central bankers. They're not centralized. They're very decentralized and so they're much more freer Uh, forms of money. So I appreciate both of them for the same reasons. Gold is something that's very simple to understand. Silver is very simple to understand. Cryptocurrency, I think, is a little bit more esoteric, more difficult for people to understand. I've been, um, you know, a longtime uh, owner of, of cryptocurrency. The problem that I see, well, there's a number of issues that I see with, with cryptocurrency, but one of them is just, it's so, people should never invest in things that they don't understand. And I highly doubt that people are, you know, who are, and they're not investing in, in cryptocurrency. They're really speculating, they're gambling, um, because I think that they don't really, I think most people don't really understand it. I wonder how many people who are buying Bitcoin at their all at its all time high have ever read the original 2008 white paper who understand hashes and Merkle trees and how it actually works. Um, you know, how the blockchain actually works, what a block actually is and how miners, you know, are part of the process and so forth. I mean, I think very few people actually really understand this. I think all the people that are bidding up Ethereum, uh, Ether uh, on the Ethereum blockchain to, you know, all time highs is up 2000% for the year. How many of these people understand a single line of code in the, you know, in the Ethereum uh, smart contract programming language? I, I don't think people really understand these things. I think they're just buying it out of pure speculation and that to me you know that that that's where things start getting a little bit uh, you know quite quite dangerous but i think conceptually yeah i mean the, the i'm i'm very excited about you know i mean every single day there's more people more businesses that they're able to accept cryptocurrency there's more and more transactions uh, of all kinds being conducted on the blockchain so this is really revolutionary stuff and i think the banks know this i think the banks are terrified uh, of this. And uh, that's a good thing. It's interesting because I was going to comment that I said, despite the fact that the original white paper is like 10 pages or less, I'm, I'm guessing less than 1% of people have, have read it. But, you know, the use case for many of these, as far as actually transacting, is not necessarily the United States, right? And so you travel all over the world. Is it something you see a lot of people transacting in general, or is it still more of a kind of speculative sort of interest? No, I think it's I think it's extremely speculative. I think it's extremely speculative. I, I doubt there's uh, I doubt there's very many people that are buying Bitcoin right now so that they can trade it for a sofa set on on Overstock.com. That's just that's just not really the use for it. And that's the thing is that I mean, going back to the white paper, the entire idea behind it in the beginning was as I mean, that's it's in the first paragraph in the white paper was as a essentially a currency for the internet to facilitate uh, e-commerce transactions. Um, it was not meant to be uh, something that people gamble and speculate on. And I think the best example of that is really what's happening in the ICO market. Um, and there are a lot of, you know, nice businesses that are getting started and funded uh, through the blockchain, through the ICO market. But man, this is the, there's so many just outright scams and people that are, you know, making, you know, minting millions and millions of dollars overnight by milking this uh, and, and, and just so many speculators that are just throwing money at something they have no earthly idea about but somebody told them that's the that's the next big thing and you can make a lot of money it's a dangerous thing in investing is i think you know very sharp investors will you know when things don't go according to plan when they you know when they make a mistake and they they suffer a loss you know sharp investors will always pause and reflect and try and figure out okay what did i do wrong here what was the mistake that i made what did i miss and incorporate that into their education so that they don't do that again the problem is is that most investors, even very, very sharp investors, don't do that when the opposite happens, when they achieve success. When we're successful, it's our human nature to automatically presume that we were successful because we're so smart. And we seldom reflect on our successes like we do our failures and really wonder, was I successful? Did I make money because I'm smart? Or did I just get just stupidly lucky? And 
there are so many people that have made an enormous amount of money in, in cryptocurrency um, and probably believe that because they think that they're so smart and they and they're taking a lot of that now and they're going and 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 really misallocating uh, capital in egregious proportions and you know funding companies that have no business being funded and so forth and and there's a lot of hubris I think in that entire uh, asset class and all that mixed together with all this funny money that's being funneling into it and and uh, I mean so much speculation and so forth I just that, that these are generally not positive ingredients you know that tend to uh, you know tend to end well but I think over the long term I mean, I did an analysis on this. If you look at, you know, if you compare something like Bitcoin to the Swiss franc, I mean, look at how many Bitcoin users there are. There's already more Bitcoin users than there are people in Switzerland. And you look at the sort of the the totality, the volume of transactions that are possible on Bitcoin versus the, you know, the ways that the that the Swiss franc can be used. It certainly stands the reason at some point that perhaps the, you know, the market cap of Bitcoin could easily be, you know, the the market cap of the Swiss franc. Certainly, the money supply of the Swiss franc. So, I mean, I think over the long term. Uh, there are a lot of you know, very strong possibilities for where these things go from here. And I would actually make the same argument about gold um, as well. But, uh, you know, right now, I just think that, the, you know, the crypto market in particular is just way too uh, overheated with way too much speculative, uninformed capital that's into it. I'm agreeing with you. By the way, listeners, ICO stands for Initial Coin Offering, and we've seen some pretty crazy ones cross our desk. And I'm I've been a I've been a kind of consistent, uh, positive cheerleader for cryptocurrencies for a number of years. I don't own any. Uh, nobody's ever given me one. Um, but certainly over the past few months, as you see this FOMO of a speculative investments, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum making these 10, 100 bagger sort of returns, you get a lot of the the speculative sort of bubble-esque coincident indicators, you know, un, uninformed people getting involved, people chasing it. It reminds me a lot of the South Sea bubble. And I couldn't find my old copy. So I just picked up a copy of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and Madness of Crowds and just uh, wanted to do another reread. And investors, if you haven't read it, it's a fantastic book. There's a line in there that reminds me of this. A lot of these joint stock companies that, that were issuing at the time that reminds me so much of what these ICOs are doing. And the line was, you know, there, there was a company to be founded with the purpose of carrying on an undertaking of great advantage, but no one to know what it is. Anyway, and then a bunch of people invested in the investor disappeared in the night and never to be seen from again. So be careful out there. And now a word from our sponsor. Let's talk about how you can start earning passive income by investing in rental properties through Roofstock, an online marketplace for buying and selling tenant-occupied homes. That means you begin earning rental income as soon as you buy the property. So there's no need to worry about finding the tenant yourself. Whether you live in California, New York, or anywhere in between, Roofstock makes it efficient and hassle-free to diversify your portfolio and invest remotely in high-yield markets like Atlanta or Memphis. They put all the property reports and financials at your fingertips so you can easily find the right rental property to help you meet your investment goals. They even take the hassle out of finding someone to manage the day-to-day tasks of owning rental property by connecting you with vetted local property managers for effortless ownership. Every property is thoroughly evaluated by the Roofstock certification team, so you know it's in good condition with a reliable tenant in place. Best of all, Roofstock certified properties are backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can invest with confidence. Roofstock, property investing made simple. If you visit roofstock.com forward slash meb, you can learn more about rental income investing and browse exclusive listings today. And now back to the show. That's probably kind of a good segue to talk a little bit more about your kind of investing framework in general. It's fun to read kind of from your early days where you reminisce about trading stocks and day trading on margin, you know, when you were younger and buying and selling compact brings back a lot of memories for me, (laughs) certainly of the 90s and 2000s. And then kind of what's your general philosophy on investing now, you know, particularly, uh, you know, I I think. I would probably qualify you as a value investor, but maybe I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about your framework and how you think about investing in general. Well, I just tend to be very risk focused, and as a you know a very risk averse investor, I I always try and ensure that I've got lots and lots of protection, that I've got a huge margin of safety. So 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of people might call that value investing. I think in our hearts, uh, I think most people are probably value investors and value investing makes a lot of sense because, yeah, okay, that is generally how we tend to buy most things uh, as human beings, except for some reason, financial investments, we like to spend a lot of money on on things that are really popular. But for me, yeah, I, I, I like big margins of safety. And so, but it takes me across, you know, that generally takes me to different asset classes. There are, I think, niche corners of, of value in the world where there are substantial margins of safety. Our chief investment strategist looks, you know, he tends to focus on these, these little corners of the world and smaller markets where, you know, he's finding companies that are profitable companies that pay dividends, that have tons of free cash flow, that are actually selling for less than the amount of cash they have in the bank. I mean, their market cap is literally not even below net tangible asset level. It is below their net cash balances. I mean, that's how cheap some companies can go. And people always wonder, how is that even possible? You know, the company could be trading for less than its net cash balance. And I would say, well, the flip side of that is, how is it possible for loss making companies to be trading for to be selling for tens of billions, even hundreds of billions of dollars? That doesn't make any sense either. And yet that's the market that we're in. So I think just something can be extremely overvalued, something can be extremely undervalued as well. But I don't do a lot of public equities simply because there really is very, very, there's not a lot of value. There are these little pockets of value, uh, you know, very, you know, smaller cap stuff. But I tend to focus on other asset classes. So, you know, I do private equity. Um, I, I try and, and and buy entire businesses. And one of the reasons that I do that is because the valuations are so much more attractive. Uh, whereas in public markets, I have to pay, you know, 50 or 60 times earnings for a company for a wonderful business uh, in private markets uh, for a privately listed, uh, privately held company. You know, I might pay, uh, we bought a company a year and a half ago. I paid barely over one times earnings uh, for this company. And so these are the sorts of things that are possible in private markets. So I do tend to do a lot of private equity. I also, since I started my bank, I do a lot of secured lending now. And that's really one of my favorite things to do. You know, being able to, you know, generate a 9, 12, 13% return uh, that's secured by an asset that has a quotable price and something that I have legal, physical or administrative custody over, you know, at a three to one margin, that's, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a great deal because there's a lot of margin of safety there. So, you know, for me, the, the, when I think about it, the investment, uh, investing in the investments that, that I make and most of that stuff goes through my bank these days, it's pretty much all outside of, uh, of public markets now because I just, it's very, very, very difficult for me to find anything that's worthwhile uh, or interesting in the mainstream. You know, it's it's interesting. We, we talk more and more about private equity on this podcast, and it's so much less about what most investors think of when they think of private equity, when they're thinking of Yale Endowment investing with the Silicon Valley type of big time PE firms that manage 10 billion and all that stuff that no one has access into anyway. And if you don't have the top 10%, it's, it's, you might as well buy the S&P. But two of the biggest advantages of private equity investing, and we have a podcast coming up, an entire episode on this in another week or two. One of the biggest ones is a behavioral reason. And the biggest, one of the biggest problems with public equities, as you know, Simon, is that people can see the prices every day and it leads them to so many bad behavior of, of selling after they go down and they're volatile and it's just a very emotional experience. Private equity, one of the biggest benefits, it doesn't matter if you're buying the ice cream shop down the street or a bread maker or a, a angel investment in a internet company that makes apps, whatever it may be, what people think is a drawback, one of the biggest benefits is you can't sell often, right? So if you're a minority owner, you're in it for five, 10 years minimum, you know, they may sell and you may have it. A, so a lot of people, one, spend so much more time doing homework on that business, just like buying a house. You know, a lot of people aren't flipping houses every year. And second, they can't sell at the wrong times when they're kind of forced to. And so that's a, I've, I've kind of, really warmed up over the past five, six, seven years to that sort of private equity, largely f despite the, the, the better valuations, which you mentioned, but also for the behavioral reasons as well. So, so most, most people listening aren't going to go start a bank. So that's good. That's going to be a little harder for them to do, but there's plenty of resources certainly for private equity. And then I wanted to even ask you as well from, from one farmer to another, 
I have probably the smallest wheat farm in all of the United States, but you you have somehow come to grow to to be one of the biggest blueberry and I think walnut producers in South America. How in the world did you get that started? Do you have a little tomato garden out back and just think, hey, I think I I can grow this business? How how'd that start? Yeah, I say I lick my thumb and stick it up in the air and uh, yeah, no, it's um. It, it really came down to, I mean, looking at the asset class in general, looking at the fundamentals of food and thinking, you know, with agriculture, you have to think very, very long term and, you know, thinking through, well, is there, are there more people that are going to be needing food or fewer people that are going to be needing food? Is there more, you know, is there more supply of food or less supply of food? And, and the more I really dove into this, the more I realized that demand was increasing and yet the supply particularly is defined by the amount of arable farmland available per capita was really declining. Uh, And so I, you know, it was pretty clear to me that I wanted to get in that, uh, in that business and blueberries uh, happened to be something that I had quite a bit of experience with. Uh, And here in South America, it was, it was obvious because the fundamentals were in in the fresh fruit market. um, You know, you're dealing a lot with labor costs and you have a world market supply. There's a price, uh, you know, that's basically, it's very similar throughout the world. And yet down here in South America, the the upfront capital costs are lower, the land costs are lower, the operating expenses are lower, which makes the returns so much higher because essentially the price that we get for our product is the same as, as what a North American producer would get or a European producer would get. So essentially the revenue is just as high, sometimes even higher, because there's a global scarcity during the times of peak production down in the Southern Hemisphere. And yet all the costs, the investment costs, the operating costs are so much lower, so the yields are so much higher. And doing that in, you know, for uh, essentially, you know, a, a, a sector, an industry where there were pretty clear and compelling long-term supply and demand fundamentals, that was that was really what it was uh, – what it was all about. But it started off as just me personally, you know, living on my own uh, farm and and realizing, well, this is, you know, this is great uh, in terms of a lifestyle, but also uh, there's a lot of money to be made here. And, uh, and that's when it, uh, that's when I got started. That was back in 2014. Oh, wow. So relatively recent. So what, in, in most individual investors, I mean, again, this is another kind of challenging investment to make unless you're going to be involved. We, we'd long been interested in trying to come up with some farmland and agriculture producing proxies as public investable products, but it's really hard. I think to my knowledge, there's only, there was two farmland REITs in the US, now there's only one. So it's, it's kind of a tough investment for a lot of investors to get exposure to. Any, any suggestions there? No, I agree with you. It's very difficult to find public instruments for investing in farmland and, and, uh, and agriculture. It's, uh, it's a difficult thing to do. All right. Not, all, not always easy answers to everything. Look, we're, we got to start winding down because I've already had you for an hour and there's like a thousand other questions I want to ask you, but we'll have to have you back on maybe next time you're in Los Angeles. One of the things, you know, Santiago is, is a very famously pro entrepreneur kind of culture. I remember they used to have some, a lot of incentives for moving down there and starting up companies. And I, I know you guys do some annual events and entrepreneurial education. What sort of entrepreneurial advice would you have for the listeners, particularly for people that are starting up businesses or early in their career thinking about investing in private company? What, what's, what's some sort of entrepreneurial advice that you've kind of put together over the years and after speaking to so many young people? Well, the thing that I try and tell people every year at this, uh, at this event that we have for our students is uh, it's always the same. It's that Starting a business and growing a business and running a business and managing a business and all these things are all skills. And their skills no different than riding a bike or learning how to shoot pool or conducting brain surgery, all these things, uh, you know, varying degrees of complexity. These are all skills. Um, but it's a funny thing about business. And I think it's actually similar uh, with investing. I mean, if I handed you a knife, you wouldn't, you know, and you had a desire to be a surgeon, you wouldn't feel qualified simply because you had a knife and a desire that you you wouldn't feel qualified to conduct open heart surgery. You would recognize that it takes years of study and training and apprenticeship and and all sorts of things in order to be qualified to do so. But, you know, with business, uh, it's a little bit different. I think a lot of people think I have an idea, ipso facto, um, you know, I have what it takes to run a business. And you know, the reality is, is that most people don't have the skills because they've never been taught to us before. They're not part of the, you know, a state 
controlled public education. You know, we don't necessarily have classes on on building businesses and, and growing businesses and marketing and all these sorts of things that, that, that doesn't really exist in, in, in school. And so, you know, aside from just raw instinct, most people just don't have the opportunity to really learn that stuff. And so my advice is always the same. It's go and learn that. And the best way to learn those skills, these are easily acquirable skills. It's not business is not rocket science. Starting a business is not rocket science. There's a lot of work involved, but it's not enormously complex as long as you have the skills. And the most important thing you can do, I think, with anything, and this goes for, uh, I think, business as well as investing, is learn those skills from other people. Find other people that are very talented and, and, and accomplished at business, at starting businesses, growing businesses, running businesses, or in the case of investing, you know, being able to manage a lot of money and, you know, making sharp investments and so forth and learn from those people. And that's the best way to develop those skills. And once you do that, then you'll find that you'll be able to apply those skills across a wide range of opportunities and achieve a lot of uh, success and prosperity for yourself. It reminded me of a story. One of our common friends, Steve Sugarud, who's been on the podcast, has a great article once where he was talking about, he was at a conference with Jim Rogers, famous investor, investment biker, adventure capitalist, and co-Soros PM back in the day. And Jim was sitting at a table and there were seats open. And he said no one would go sit next to him because they were probably scared and felt too timid. And so he said he went and sat down next to him and have, have been friends ever since. And I think that's a great just analogy for life in general that so many people never reach out to a lot of these investors or business people or whatnot just because they're afraid to ask. And so, you know, remember, remember, uh, listeners, worst thing to say, people could say is no. So that's great advice. About two more questions and then I'm going to let you go. You have a big subscriber base all over the world, and I'm sure a lot of people write in to you just like they do with our our podcast and emails as well. What what, what are most people concerned about today? Is there a common thread or theme that, or is it something that's kind of the same as always? Is uh, anything that comes to mind? Well, I mean, I think it goes back to what I said earlier. I, I think everybody understands that there's something just fundamentally wrong. They can look at investment markets and see that there's something fundamentally wrong in investment markets. They can look at uh, what's happening in their own government and sense that there's something that's fundamentally wrong. In many cases, even with a, you know, kind of wake up one day and feel like this is not the country that I used to live in. This is something that is, is clearly changed. And that causes a lot of discomfort. And so we do hear about that a lot. Uh, and a lot of people are you know, trying to seeking to understand really what's happening and why and 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 what's behind it all. Um, but I think you know people really feel in their bones and their instincts that there's been a lot of change and and uh, a lot of it really not for the better. And, and are you speaking specifically to the U.S. or is that kind of a global response? I think it's a global issue. I mean, I can I can see this in Italy. I can see it in Greece. I can see it in in a lot of places uh, around the world. And and I you know I think. My, my my general uh, view, I mean, just based on what we hear a lot from people is that, yeah, there's a lot of people that are very nervous, even scared about uh, what they see and what's happening. And they're nervous about it. And they're trying to figure out what do they do about it? How do they fix it? And, uh, you know, trying to sort out where, you know, where it might end up. So that's that's what we hear about a lot. You just need a good common human enemy. Maybe an alien invasion would be perfect. A, a weak alien invasion would be great to unite unite the world. Or robots. Robots seem to be a nice AI threat. All right. So you got one question we always ask everyone in 2017, the guests. And this can be a good one. It can be a bad one. But it's usually the first thing that comes to mind. Over your entire career, what's been your most memorable investment or trade? Well, uh, there's a lot to come to mind, but probably uh, you mentioned one earlier. The one that I certainly learned the most from was uh, when I was a a 19-year-old kid who thought that I had already figured out everything that there was to know. And uh, yeah, I was was day trading Compaq. This was, you know, back in the in the dot com boom when Compaq was a company, you know, one of these companies that was anointed and couldn't possibly go wrong. And and I was day trading this company, and I think I was probably the guy that literally bought at the top, and um, <laughs> just rode that thing down. And not only was I day trading, I was day trading on margin. Didn't understand anything. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. And uh, basically ended up getting wiped out by the by the margin calls and paid for that dearly. It was an enormous amount of money for me at the time and, you know, paid for that for the next several years. 
And uh, so, yeah, that was that one was quite memorable. I got some I got some near identical stories. You and I are close to the same age. So that's we lived through an interesting time together. But it's good to learn those lessons when you're younger. And hopefully it's a cheaper tuition than, than doing it today. Absolutely. So you've been you've been to 120 countries. I think there's only what, like 180 or 90 um, what's, what's any, uh, any real cool ones on your to-do list for the rest of the year, uh, or any favorites that you're going to be heading back to? Well, yeah, I'll be back in Venezuela next week, more than likely. Um, it's actually, it's interesting was what happens when a country goes bankrupt. It's actually very difficult now to get in and out of Venezuela. Commercial air carriers have actually terminated their service. So there's very few airlines, uh, that are still servicing Venezuela. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to get into now. But I'm a little curious about that. I uh, will be heading back to Colombia as well. Love going to Colombia. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've got a lot of places that I really love being. I'm 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 pretty open uh, when I go around the world. Um, just got back from a couple months in Europe and and uh, Asia, and yeah, it's just, uh, it's it's great to get out there and and see so much of the world, see lots of opportunity and interesting things happening, and it's a uh, it's a great thing to see firsthand. And is this mostly for you? Is this mostly kind of boots on the ground research? Is it mixed in with a little personal fun? Are you looking to invest in businesses while you're there? Talk to entrepreneurs, take down governments. What's the kind of main thrust of the <laughs> all, most all of these the trips? Mix? Yeah, all of the above. And with the with the with the one thing as well is uh, you know relationship building and and uh, you know just going and, and spending time with. You know, with people that are uh, important to me in, in my life. And so I'm, you know, I'm willing to fly across the world to have dinner with somebody. You know, I think relationships are an enormous and, and uh, unfortunately undervalued type of wealth, but I believe very highly in them. So it's, they're, they're important to me and I invest in them. And that's one of the reasons that I travel as well. Totally agree. I have Iceland for the first time on my schedule this year, as well as some work trips to Amsterdam and of course Orlando. Iceland's great. You're gonna you're gonna love Iceland. It's it's fantastic. When I went there not too long ago, they were shooting still um, Game of Thrones in Iceland, and I rented a helicopter. and My pilot and I were flying around. And we actually buzzed over the set uh, while they were in the middle of filming. So that was <laughs> really, they had to <laughs> dub you awesome. out. Probably that's uh, there's yeah. probably a Easter egg somewhere where people can can find you in one of the scenes. Yeah, Simon, so, mean, it's been a blast today. I've had a lot of fun. Where uh, if people were more interested in following your writings and everything you're doing, uh, where do they find you? Uh, it's Sovereignman.com. Perfect. That was an easy answer. Thanks for coming today, and I uh, hope we can do it again sometime. Okay, sounds great. We'll see you guys in LA. Listeners, thanks for taking the time to listen. Please welcome feedback. If you've got any questions for us, feedback at themebfavorshow.com. As a reminder, you can find the show notes and more episodes, mebfavor.com forward slash podcast. Subscribe to the show on iTunes. And if you're enjoying it, hating it, whatever, please leave us a review. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. <laughs>